record it. Now here, I can also record the statement of the accused. So suppose FIR is saying that I committed the offense. So even I can be taken to the court and my statement can be recorded. Now this is what happened in Kasab's case. So after he was arrested, he was taken to a magistrate and that magistrate recorded the statement of Kasab, where he clearly explained how he came to India, with whom he came, before coming to India, how he was trained and all that. And like he explained everything, how he attacked, where all he went, everything he explained. So because it was recorded by the court, it could be used as evidence. However, I'm not saying this is enough to punish him. This evidence should be uh, corroborated. It should be supported by other evidence, right? So with other ad additional evidence and all, if this can clearly prove that Kasab was the one who uh, committed the offense beyond reasonable doubt, only then we could prosecute him, only then we could convict him, and only because of that he get, he got punished, even with death sentence, right? So therefore, you record a statement, it's of no use as a police officer, you should take him to magistrate and get his statement recorded. So that is 164. Next is the most relevant one. So this is search and seizure, relevant because this is where cyber forensics comes into picture. Now, when if it is a case of murder, and uh, I go and confiscate a knife. Uh, so there's a method of like confiscating it. I can't simply go and touch the knife, right? Because my fingerprint will get mixed with accused fingerprint or other fingerprints available on the weapon. So like I use a blouse, I use a cover, I put the knife in the cover, I seal the cover. So there are precautions I take so that evidence doesn't get tampered. Now think about a, a digital evidence. So suppose it's a case of cyber attack. It's a case of cyber terrorism. So what evidence do I collect? So maybe it is a computer. So how do I go and uh, so, uh, search uh, the evidences? How do I seize the computer? Section 167 says you follow the procedure laid down under section 100. Now what is 100? So section 100 just says that uh, you know, when you go to conduct search and seizure, along with you take two people who can be witnesses to the search and seizure. Example, I'm going to the house of A, to search for some evidences, when I go, I should take with me two people who are the residents of that place where I'm conducting search, that is from the neighborhood, and they should be respectable people. They shouldn't be the one who have criminal records, you know. They should be respectable, independent people of that area. So with them, I go to the house where I want to conduct search and seizure, and in their presence, I should search for evidence. Whatever evidence I get, I should collect it and record it on a paper. So it's called like, on a record, it's called a seizure memo. Or some of you would have heard about punch nama. So it's a punch nama. So there are different names used, but basically I have to write down whatever I confiscated in the so-and-so place. Uh, why was it called as punch nama earlier? Like even now referred to as like that. Earlier days, law said you should take five witnesses with you, panchas, five witnesses. But nowadays they've reduced it to two, but word used is still pancha, punch nama. So I go with these two people. They should be seeing what I'm searching, confiscating, right? Now let's assume I go and conduct search and see, and seize a blue pen. So I have to write that I confiscated a blue pen of so and so length, etc. And then those two witnesses will sign on it. And if it is in the house of A, A should also sign on it, so that owner or the occupier of the house will also sign on it. Let's assume the matter goes to the court tomorrow. So whatever you have written should match with what you produced before the court. In the paper I've written, it is a you know, red, blue color pen, but I produced to the court a red color pen. So gone, the evidentiary value is gone. Now this is about what you can see. This is all about like pens. Imagine when it comes to digital evidence. One is you can't see, right? It's all like sometimes it's metadata, etc. Secondly, even if you see it in form of pen drive and all, so let's assume I confiscate pen drive from a crime scene. I have to clearly, you know, put a label and like, you know, give some number and then write it in the panchnama, make the witnesses see the number here as well as see the number of panchnama, then take signature. When it goes to the court, they should be able to say that, yes, this was the pen drive which was confiscated in our presence. And not just the number, so all of these devices will have its own like identifying features, number and all, right? For example, if you do right click on your computer, you'll know property details. So mention that also in the panchnama, like mobile phones, IMEI number. I know otherwise tomorrow, like I like I know I'll say I confiscated this phone, but witnesses will say we don't know whether it is this phone. There was some black phone. 
or they'll say it was some black pen drive gone your case is gone that's why we get a lot of acquittals so therefore when police go to the crime scene they have to identify not just two independent witnesses from that neighborhood but they should ensure that these two witnesses are able to understand what police are doing are you doing hashing are you doing imaging are you confiscating are you even removing battery if a layman is not able to understand how will he support your case tomorrow in the court how will he support the police case in the uh, court tomorrow tomorrow if they say you know we don't know it was some system i don't even remember whether it is the system or i know it was some black laptop it was some orange laptop it was some lenovo laptop nothing more to clearly identify gone case is gone now this i can give you another example a small mistake in documentation can affect prosecution case so there was one case where police had confiscated bronze churis churis the weapons but while writing in north india even now they use english words for hindi terms so instead of writing it as churis there was one spelling mistake it was written as chudis instead of r it was d c h u d i s matter goes to the court see if those witnesses support what you have said then fine but in this case witnesses said no we don't know we don't know uh, you know like what was seized and in our presence churis were not confiscated document also there is a mistake they they are also not supporting case is gone so therefore documented properly take proper witnesses who can support your confiscation otherwise it will be a very good case for defense right so that is about search and seizure and when you are doing imaging when you are doing hashing explain it to the witnesses so that they understand what's happening if they go and tell the court that you know they confiscate they opened a laptop in my presence and they did something on the laptop unable to if you are unable to explain to the court that it was nothing but hashing you did not do any interference with the laptop so then okay otherwise the whole case is gone so police will say no you have handled the evidence even before seizing so you have tampered the evidence so this is also possible so i think tomorrow onwards the sessions are going to take you through forensic procedure which will help you to understand what exactly i'm saying so what we need is that forensic procedure of hashing image should go simultaneously with legal procedure you don't have two independent witnesses gone you know it's very hard to get ad admissibility of evidence right so then we have another section which says if i am collecting evidence in my police station 165 will apply, will apply now what if that evidence is available in a place which belongs to another police station like i am investigating a case in bangalore but evidence is available in tumkur so i have to request that police officer of tumkur to collect it and send it to me or in a case of emergency i go collect it come back but i have to inform tumkur police about what i have done so especially if it is between one state to another state it becomes more complicated karnataka police simply can't go to kerala police and collect evidence so the state should cooperate in fact like it's more easier for me to explain now because we've all seen what happened between bihar police and maharashtra police they'll not even allow you to enter the state right and even if you are entering they have their own state rules which can be against you and also unless there is cooperation the evidence is gone right now coming to this 161 also what if that witness is in hyderabad how will you bring him to bangalore and what if he is not ready to come who will bear his expenses he doesn't want to travel by train or bus he wants to come by flight because he wants to go back on the same day who will bear this i who can bear once twice but throughout the procedure of investigation it's not possible that's another challenge that affects investigation let's move ahead so that is 166 so imagine if the evidence is available abroad now if it is available say in france or in pakistan pakistan too is ruled out we'll never get evidence from them so even kasab got punished and that immediately after that we asked pakistan to send those other offenders who were involved in conspiracy with kasab but they still did not send him forget about pakistan or china uk so we are struggling to get you know uh, uh, malya even now neeru modi even now so we are taking years to even get them so getting people is one issue but getting evidence from there is another issue so to collect evidence from abroad so this is covered under 166a 166a says that india should have an mlat agreement with that other country what is mlat mutual legal assistance treaty so unless you have this treaty with that country that country will not cooperate with you so and as of now we have these treaties signed with around say 50 plus countries how about the rest of the country you don't have mlat which means they will not share information with you okay so you need this mlat agreement see people might say why is our for you know prime minister traveling across the world and all 
Uh, simply wasting money. No, when they go, they sign a lot of agreements, trade related and all. But personally, I know that we've signed a lot of bilateral agreements with countries. Bilateral is two countries' agreements. We have signed it with uh, 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 Mauritius because that's where a lot of black money was going. So a lot of countries, when they sign, it helps us to collect evidence, especially for terrorism, money laundering and all. It's very, very crucial. Switzerland. So if you remember, like a lot of our celebrities and all would invest in Swiss bank. Why? Because with them, we didn't have an agreement for sharing information, but now we have. So that's how we're getting to know about money laundering case. It's not like very easy that you get the uh, you know, evidence from them, but at least agreements will help. Agreements are not binding, but at least they, you know, uh, at least they favor this exchange of information. Okay, so either have this mutual legal assistance treaty, or or you have a bilateral agreement. Or you have multilateral agreement. Multilateral means multiple countries coming together and, and agreeing to exchange evidences. For example, in Europe, you have European Convention, or it's also called as Budapest Convention. So, according to this convention, all the members of European region should share information with each other in relation to cybercrime. America is also a party, but India is not a party, so we will not get evidence from them. Then there are some uh, agreements that we've signed with like locally. So maybe with Nepal we have. So that's how we could solve some terrorism case. But can you think of such an agreement with our other neighbors, Pakistan, China? No, again, not possible. So again, having an agreement is helpful, but not having is gone case, right? So that is one procedure. Now, if you have agreement, how do you collect this evidence? The procedure of collecting evidence is first, the police officer who's investigating the case, he wants an evidence from abroad, should first write a letter to the magistrate. For example, he's a police officer from Bangalore, he should write to Bangalore magistrate. Bangalore magistrate is convinced that yes, this evidence should be procured from USA. So let's assume that evidence is available in Washington, in US. So magistrate will forward this to NCB. What is NCB? It's a part of, it's a unit of CBI. It's called National Crimes Bureau. So it goes there. It's a part of CBI. It's in the CBI headquarters in Delhi. So the letter goes there. Another copy of the letter goes to Ministry of Home Affairs. Another copy goes to Ministry of External Affairs. Why External Affairs? Because you're involving other countries. So it has to go through there. Another copy goes to our diplomatic office of that country. If all of these are convinced that your case requires evidence from abroad, so then they'll forward to each other. Then it goes to the diplomatic agency of USA. Through them, it goes to USA. No, it's just an example of USA taken. In USA, again, it goes to similar ministries. So there they'll have foreign ministry. There they'll have home ministry. Similar names may be different, but it goes to say so-and-so ministry, etc. Then it goes to, let's assume, as I said, Washington, right? So Washington, uh, it will go to the Washington court. They may call it as magistrate or whatever, county court, whatever. So it goes to the court. That court will collect the evidence and send, or that court will ask their police officers to collect the evidence and send. So look at the complexity we have. It is so complex. It has to, the letter should go through so many hands. Anyone can drop it in between. And then those, and then back, you know, when they collect and send, it will come back in the same manner, in a reverse direction. Police to US court, US court to US diplomatic agency, ministers, etc. Then it will come to our NCB and from then to our local court and then from there to our local police. Krishna committee, which has worked on personal data, in fact, talks about this. This is an extremely important issue that we all should be aware of as citizens. Today, Krishna committee says that even the minimum time taken to get evidence from abroad is eight months and then maximum can go on for years. Secondly, other country may not even respond. So in many cases, we don't get evidences because they'll say in their country, privacy law is more important than your criminal case. They say in their country, their citizens' fundamental rights are important than your criminal case. So many times you don't even get the evidence. So that's the reason why we get acquittals, right? So this is the procedure of investigating any criminal case, whether it is murder or whatever. And for cybercrime, it's more relevant because as I said earlier, you take any internet intermediary, they're all US-based. It's Facebook, Twitter, it's uh, Yahoo, it's Google. So we are not like, you know, using our services. See, that's why current government is asking for people to come with local innovations, you know, and they're encouraging a lot for local data centers and all. So why are we asking for lo localization of data? Localization of data is nothing but at least have a server here. So we're insisting that Facebook should have a server here so that when we want, we can just go as per 165. 
if it's in india you can follow 165 right if it is in abroad you have to follow 166 so this is why we are asking for data localization but what is happening you are all from engineering field so you know like you work closely with kids who go to industries tomorrow they work in mncs so what mncs want is they don't want localization because they think you know we can't again spend for servers huge machines in india we always have it there so why do we have to again spend here for them it is money but for us it is security for us it is criminal prosecution so this is anyways going on so we will see how pdp bill is going to address this right so one is it's not just getting it from there many times we are refused and we don't get it from there so like 166 here we also have another section that is 166b now 166b is vice versa of 166a another country wants evidence from us so uh, they uh, collect the evidence in the same manner now there are many reasons why other country will not share evidence with us one reason is it's called as principle of double criminality a crime should be a crime in both the country for both the country to cooperate with each other there are certain crimes which are considered as crimes in india but not in another country example publication of pornography is a crime in india but publication is not a crime in other countries so they will not even help you with collection of evidence similarly adultery was a crime in india now it is no more crime but earlier like it was only crime in some countries like india in other country it was in there so like this there are many crimes which are not crimes in their country so they will not cooperate with you secondly uh, some countries are you know they think they are very sensitive but they are against custodial torture so they say no we will not send this person to your country because you might subject him to custodial torture or some countries will not cooperate if the offense is punishable with death sentence because they think they are against death sentence so there are lot of procedural complications and end of the day we may not get evidence that's why current government is very particular about get, getting data localization so data transfer is again nothing but when data is shared from one country to another between industry it's happening but when police want they don't get so that's the problem right so that is about 166 Uh, and related provision then you have 167 i said all the offenses or almost all the offenses are cognizable which means they can be investigated by police and while investigating police can arrest a person okay this is relevant for us as common people the same what's happening with arnab goswami now i'll leave it to you to decide whether it's rightly happening or wrongly happening what is the law law says if it is cognizable earlier law said you could arrest 2009 we amended the crpc and now it says cognizable but it should be punishable with more than 7 years of imprisonment okay so then you can arrest less than 7 years of imprisonment instead of arresting the accused this ask him to come to the police station take all the information send him back don't arrest because arrest means what it's breach of our uh, right to life right so and then uh, unless you prove me guilty beyond reasonable doubt i'm still not convicted because our our law believes in the principle of uh, uh, innocence of a person till he is proved guilty right because we say like let 100 people who have done crime go unpunished but one innocent shouldn't get punished so when we believe in that principle how can you arrest me now only even before you know proving the case before the court so therefore there is a limitation in the law which is arrest if it is cognizable plus punishable with more than 7 years arrest if it is cognizable but punishable with less than 7 years provided you think that i am interfering with your investigation i am destroying the evidence i am influencing the witnesses or i am trying to run away from the country do you see anything like that happening in all these recent arrests if it is not so then it is not valid okay so that's one thing now what uh, so anyways so this is one thing secondly even if you arrest we classify offenses into bailable and non bailable bailable offenses are simple in nature as soon as i am arrested i should be released on bail because it's a matter of my right to be released on bail non bailable offenses are the ones where matter goes to the court so i apply for bail court will decide whether i should be released on bail or not so here the court again says you know am i actually involved in the case so is there any evidence at this point of time to indicate that i might be involved because you still don't know that i have involved is difference between i might have involved and i have actually involved so when it is yet to be proved court will see is there any evidence indicating my uh, you know uh, um, um, involvement in the crime and so this is one ground so then they'll see the age of the person two age they usually give bail women they can give bail not in all cases but sometimes gender matters women with a child can give reputed person 
Salman Khan gets bail. You know, uh, as if somebody is about to run away from the country, he will not get. But you know, one hand Salman Khan gets bail, but then uh, 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 Janardhan Reddy doesn't get bail because they thought he can influence witnesses. So many times it's political dimension. But these are grounds that the court says. So non-bailable cases, I may or may not release a person on bail. It is my discretionary power. Bailable, I have to release him on bail. So, but then there are grounds, guidelines given, which I should follow when I'm deciding these matters, right? So, now if you see in Arnab's case, so you also come across a word called as remand order. So, let me go through a little uh, bit about remand order. So, what is remand order? Now, our constitution law as well as criminal law says that as soon as a person is arrested, only for 24 hours, you can keep him in the police station. If you are the police, you arrest, keep him only for 24 hours. After 24 hours, immediately take him to magistrate. Okay, so then magistrate will decide whether he should come back to police station or he should be released or he should go to prison. Okay, so here we use two words called as judicial custody and police custody. Police custody means sending him back to police station through an order. So I issue an order saying that he should go back to police because they want to conduct investigation. Your presence for that investigation is necessary. They want to interrogate you. So therefore, I'll say you are sent back to police station. But when I think that this person can be subjected to torture, or when I think that this person's presence in police station is not necessary, he can be in the prison, but not necessary in the police station, I'll send him to regular prison. So that is called as judicial custody. Okay. So this is what has happened with Arnab Goswami. So now he is in judicial custody. Okay. So court will give an order called as remand order. In a remand order, they'll say it is police custody or they'll say it is judicial custody. Police custody means he'll come back to police station. Judicial custody means he will go to the court. So this is what is as of now happening in even um, uh, like uh, the two actresses who are arrested in Kanaka, they are in judicial custody. They are in prison. But remember, this is not punishment. Punishment will only come after the trial is over. This is only during investigation. So it's only to facilitate investigation by keeping them in prison. So all these are governed by 167. So then you have 173. I'm jumping to the only important sections. Under 173, let's assume after registering FIR, after three months or six months, I've completed my investigation. I have all the evidence that I've collected with me. So I collect all that, prepare a report, and give that report to the court. So this is nothing but charge sheet. So it's also called as police report, or it's called as investigation report. So it's called as charge sheet, police report, investigation report. Right? Or sometimes it's also called as chala. So let's keep it simple. Let's just call it as charge sheet. The charge sheet is filed by the police uh, police officer to the magistrate. And in the charge sheet, he'll say, yes, the offense that I started investigating is committed. So in the, your FIR, your whole case started with FIR, right? So it starts with FIR and it ends with charge sheet. So in the FIR, suppose uh, uh, I am the informer, I go and say that I saw A killing B. So an FIR of murder was registered. Now, police, after collecting evidence, they'll say, yes, it is a case of murder. Or they can say, no, it is not a case of murder. From our evidence, it has turned out to be an accidental killing. Or I'll say, no, it is not accidental. It is negligent homicide. Or I'll say it is dowry death. Or I'll say it is not an offense at all. It was some heart attack case. Okay? So my opinion can be anything. Now, if you can relate to what had happened in Salman uh, Khan's case. Initially, FIR was registered as, uh, say, a road accident case. But then the court said, no, we will not take it as road accident case. We'll take it as culpable homicide. That is killing, you know, one person killing another person. So the opinion you give may not convince the court, but you give your opinion under 173. So this is how investigation ends. So between all this, you know, uh, if it is a cyber crime case, everything is exactly the same. You have to register FIR. Police will record witness statements. If necessary, they'll take accused of the witness to the court and they'll conduct search and seizure. But imagine how we can conduct search and seizure if the evidence is on cloud, cloud server is in another country. Those are the problems. So that's an MLAT process will come. And in the course of this case, I can arrest and accuse, but I can only keep him for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, he will go to the court. Or if it is a bailable offense, I can't even keep him for 24 hours. Immediately, I should release him on bail. Suppose he's not released on bail because it's a serious and a non-bailable case. Then I send him to the court and the court will either send him to judicial custody or prosecution custody until investigation is done. Once the investigation is done, the court will get the charge sheet. 
if i'm convinced with your charge sheet i begin with the trial so this is the investigation procedure right any questions up to here i don't want to make it too complicated because it's too yeah, it's very, very easy uh, easy yeah. go ahead no problem and that is information is necessary for everyone right so this is uh, what all of us should know as to what happens in relation to criminal cases now you may have a question why bihar police came who should register fir see all the say and now also a lot of people on facebook they write what is modi doing what is central government doing no why can't they stop what's happening in maharashtra no they can't get in because in the constitution we have three lists union list state list concurrent list any topic mentioned in union list only union government can make a law and this includes security this includes foreign relationship so related to that finance so related to that law will be made by government of india union government there are topics mentioned in state list and related to that law can only be made by state government this includes criminal laws law and order etc right so in maharashtra what criminal law should apply maharashtra government will decide it is not modi's government or it's not central government or it's not karnataka government also in karnataka which criminal law will apply karnataka government will decide kerala government can't decide similarly vice versa because it's in state list there is another list called as concurrent list so the topics related to concurrent list both the governments can make them okay like health education and all but when it comes to criminal law it is only state list okay so only states can do so now like maharashtra did not register fir you know uh, relating to sushant singh case so people were saying cbi should come cbi can't come cbi is just one of the agency which investigates a case under delhi special police establishment act they can't simply come unless the state government asks them to investigate cbi cannot come and investigate so either state government should ask cbi to investigate or the court should order either high court or supreme court should order finally what happened in this case the cbi ordered is the, the uh, supreme court ordered cbi to investigate then how come bihar there was a case that was filed in relation to this see they were very clever so father of sushant singh said like my son you know property related manipulations are there misappropriation of property has taken place so misappropriation means i have given the property to a person to be used for used for one purpose but he has used it for another purpose okay now when it comes to murder the place where murder has taken place only that place will have jurisdiction so he said also sushant singh died in maharashtra in mumbai only mumbai police will have jurisdiction okay but here i'm talking about misappropriation for misappropriation our law says the place of jurisdiction can either be the place where offence is committed or where the property was supposed to have been received so you see the clever argument father does he says like i am father of sushant property was supposed to come to me in bihar and this property is misappropriated so therefore either mumbai or bihar police can do so that's how they registered it here which is legally correct he logically also correct so that's how bihar registered a uh, no fir matter went to the court court also got convinced that bihar was fine then bihar transferred it to cbi it's not mumbai bihar transferred it to cbi so otherwise had this misappropriation angle not come transferring it to cbi was also difficult but at least later court also transferred it right so therefore jurisdiction is a matter if this could happen with suicide case imagine the complexity will have when it comes to cyber crime case and um in fact lot of studies have indicated that when a hacking takes place especially between countries and all so there are multiple systems used for example if a computer in us is hacked initial investigation traces it back to india okay it looks like as if it's been hacked from a computer in india you further investigate it will show this was a hacking done by a, a computer in china so they first hack indian computer take its control through that they hack us computer so this is all between you know different countries so extremely difficult extremely challenging and added to this it becomes more worse when they don't share data with us when facebook refuses to share data when facebook refuses to block data i'm just taking example of facebook but as we see today there are a lot of pils pending against twitter because there are you know a lot of terror related contents which were available on twitter they did not remove so all these cases anyways are going on uh, before the court okay so amidst this let's come to digital evidence when you collect the evidence from the crime scene so especially i'm talking about search and seizure so how do you collect it have they already discussed the imaging and uh, hashing 
Yes, madam. You know, Ashi. Okay. Yeah. So, can you like you know like you can definitely think of the problems that an IMO will have if it doesn't know technology, right? Like I only know about CRPC, but I don't know Ashi. I don't know imaging so gone my case is gone or i'm from technology background so i'm very good at hashing imaging and all but i don't know crpc so gone so therefore when it comes to cybercrime you need both integration of legal and uh, technical procedure so many times you fail because either you have technical experts or you have legal experts and getting somebody who knows both is very rare and charity is one such unique person i've seen at least in this field since many years who knows both and who blends both together. So, except for a few people like this across the country, it's very hard to get someone who knows more, right? Because you need like that elaborate knowledge of law also. The other thing is, let's assume you're, I'm not going as per slide, I can send you the slide later, but other crucial issues I'm focusing on. Let's assume there is an evidence in a computer. How do you produce this evidence before the court? So, there are two ways. Okay, and today computer includes communication device also. It includes mobile also. So I take the example of mobile. So suppose if I've received some annoying content on this mobile phone. How do I give it as an evidence before the court? There are two ways in which I can give this as evidence before the court. So one is I give primary evidence itself. Second is I give only secondary evidence. Okay, what is primary evidence? I go and give this device itself as evidence to the court. Fine, quite easier. But then you have to forensically check this, right? What if I have added or what if I give it to the police and police add it, right? So therefore, forensically, it should be proved that on the date on which this mobile was seized or collected or produced, it was forensically tested. And this is the mobile which is forensically tested with all the evidence in it. So this is how you'll produce. So forensic examination of mobile phone becomes important. Now, as a victim, I don't want to give this phone. I'll say, police, no, you take the content, but I'm not giving my phone. Okay. So in this case, what you should do, you should take the copy of that evidence from this mobile phone or even from computer. How do you take copy of the content from the electronic device? There are two ways, right? We all know. One is you either take soft copy or the other is you take hard copy, right? Soft copy, in a sense, you copy the entire evidence into a CD. Hard copies, you take a printout of it and give it to the court. Okay, now think it from Agu's perspective. You know, I'm saying that you know, uh, these are the you know, files you sent to my mobile phone and I'm alleging on you. But, and you are saying that, no, I never sent it. What is the proof that these contents are even from this mobile phone? So there should be some link between this mobile phone and the printout, this mobile phone and, this, and the CD, because you're not giving the mobile phone to the court, right? So this is one example. Second example, the evidence is available in a server and that server is in USA. Can you give primary evidence? You can't shift server from USA to India. You can't even shift it from Infosys company to court because servers are huge machines, as you all know. Or third scenario, the mobile phone belongs to the accused. He doesn't want to give it to you. Okay, the victim doesn't give us another issue. Why will accused give you that entire device? So in some circumstances, when you cannot give the primary evidence, so then you can give secondary evidence. But when you give secondary evidence, there should be a link that should be established between that output and the device. So the soft copy and the hard copies are called as computer output. And this computer output, if you should give a certificate saying that, that this output is from this device. So this output, like this certificate is called a 65B certificate, or it is required to be produced as per section 65B of the Indian Evidence Act. Okay, so what is this certificate? So let's assume there's an evidence that you want to give from your colleague's computer. So uh, so how do you give uh, that uh, evidence? Either take a soft copy or a hard copy. With that, you attach a certificate. And in that certificate, we'll just mention this, that I, so-and-so person, owner of so-and-so computer or so-and-so mobile phone with IMA number, other description number, Lenovo laptop, so-and-so, whatever. Give the description of the device. Or if you're not the owner, you will say, like, I'm the registrar or I'm the official in charge of this computer in this university. So you will say either your owner or you're officially in charge. And I'm handling this computer in my official capacity. And I've extracted this evidence from this uh, mobile phone or computer in form of a printout or by of copying it to a CD, right? So you're explaining to which this output belongs to, right? From this system, this output. And there you should also say that when I took the output, this computer was in a working condition. And even if some features were not working, it was not 
such a matter that it affected taking output. So keep this in mind. I'll click in your mind. I'll come to a case study. We'll understand the relevance of this importance of this. You'll also say that. Um, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, the above contents are true and all that, and we'll sign on it. So you're giving the CD or a printout with the certificate. Now, if you don't give the certificate, court will not accept this output as an evidence. Okay, now think of an investigation that has been done by a police. So they've taken CDR, called data records. Let's assume they've taken it from BSNL officers. And this is a case I had investigated three years back. So that time I didn't know I need a certificate. So I just took CDR. I just have a printout or soft copy. I've given it to the court. Court will throw away your, your evidence because you don't have 65B certificate. Now, can you go and get that 65B certificate? Yes, you can, provided you're able to go and catch that officer who given you. What if that officer is not you know, working anymore or he's transferred or he's retired? Very difficult to get this certificate, especially if you've got it from private industries like Airtel, Reliance and all. So that is where people keep changing their job, right? So even get hold of him is very, very difficult. Now you may ask, why is this even a problem? You could have taken it at the time of collecting soft copy or hard copy itself, right? Here is the problem. There was a case called as Parliament attack case. I'm sure you all know this is Abzil Guru case. Now in this case, Supreme Court said that there is no need of 65B certificate. This was, I think, decided in some 2008, something like that. Okay, so that time, like they say, it's not necessary. Or like I don't remember the date exactly, but at a particular point of time, court said 65B is not mandatory. Now, in this case, there were BSNL officers who had given CDR, but the police had not taken 65B certificate. But uh, to prove that these certificates were given by them, and these contents were given by them, BSNL officers were called to the court and they uh, certified that, yes, we have given this CDR printout and all. Based on that, he was even convicted. Right? So this is parliament attack case. Then you have 2015, another case called as, um, I'm not getting the name of the case, but I'll come back to that. Like, um, Okay, so in this 2015 case, court says certificate is mandatory. It will be in the slide. So, uh, so in this case, they make it mandatory. So you can't give an output without a certificate. Um, so then think about the time gap between parliament attack case and 2015 decision. Once the court says you don't need it, then suddenly it will say you need it. And even for previous cases, you should bring this certificate. So in between, I had investigated many cases where I had not taken these certificates. I got cert serious from ALP, Reliance and all. If I go back there, those officers are not there. So a lot of terrorism cases, a lot of serious cases got acquitted like this. Right. So this is one problem. Another problem I'll tell you, like, you know, with, a, with an actual case that happened in Karnataka, there's a case of murder. Uh, and as per the allegations, which is recorded in the decision, so the allegation is that that wife got murdered in the house during the office hours of the husband. Okay, so the prosecution alleges that it was the husband who killed the wife. And to prove this, they gave the CCTV footage of the company where he was working. It's a reputed MNC in Bangalore. The CCTV footage shows that the husband left the office at a particular point of time, and after some time, he's come back. But while leaving the office, and uh, he was wearing a light color, light blue color shirt, while coming back, he was wearing a dark blue color shirt. Okay, there's a difference in the color of the shirt he was wearing. Meantime, almost same time, murder has taken place at home. Police also say that he has a motive to kill his wife because he was in relation with some other lady. He had promised to marry her. He was actually forced by his parents to marry this lady. So they proved motive, not men say a motive. And plus the circumstantial evidence in CCTV footage format and all. In a billing, High Court says we can't rely on CCTV footage because it did not have certificate the footage was copied into a cd cd was given with the cd certificate was not there so court acquits the accused okay so is the importance of 65b so tomorrow onwards if you're just learning hashing imaging taking copies it's of no use because especially if the matter goes to the court if it is your internal inquiry industry investigation is okay but you want to get evidentiary value for this equally law procedure is very very important that's why when organizers said you have to take sessions on law i thought i won't be able to do justice unless i cover all this you know only focusing on it will not be okay so equally this is also important very recently, Supreme Court has reiterated, it has re again reconfirmed that you need certificate. So certificate is mandatory. Okay. So when you need certificate, I'll just clarify. So 
in this 2015 case, court has very clearly said that, look, if you're giving primary evidence itself, no need of 65. When you don't give primary and instead of that, you give copies. So that's when 65 is necessary. Now, this was an election petition, election related case, which came up in 2015. So when actually it was about some campaigning and all which was going on, which was against election rules. So there were some songs which were played on speakers. So this person records it on the mobile phone, comes home and gets it copied into a CD and gives the CD as evidence before the court. OK, so court clearly says, had you given your own mobile phone, we would not have asked for 65B certificate. But you have copied it into a CD, so therefore we need 65B. So they reject the case. So that's how it is important to ensure that 65B certificate is also given. Okay. Any questions up to here? Now you can think of problems we'll have when it comes to collecting evidence. Yeah, it is, uh, just like getting 65B certificate uh, for a CD or any other secondary evidence, it is just like that we are getting a notary copy, a notarized copy, no? Uh, so that's what, so if uh, if I can relate it to another issue which happens in banks, when you want to print out from bank, they just give a printout without seal, sign, nothing. Yes, yes, and yes. on that, it will be printed like this doesn't require a certificate. Something, it's not enough. If you want to use it as evidence, it should clearly prove these, you know, that you fulfill these conditions. What are those? That this is from this computer and this computer was in a working condition, all that. And then you have to put your sign and signature on it. So something which is not signed will be of no value. See, what is the importance of this sign? Let's assume tomorrow it turns out to be a false evidence. Who will take responsibility? I go and give some printout and get you trapped. Right? No, it's very no, easy to uh, trap. So no, somebody no. should take an no. undertaking saying that I am the one who is giving certificate because I have extracted the evidence. Yes, sir. Madam, my question is, is 65B getting, uh, obtaining 65B certificate, is it equivalent to that of the notarized uh, document that we produce uh, before the court? Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, I did not hear it properly. Right? See, 65B, we just use the word as certificate. How you give is left to you. You can give it in form of an affidavit. You can give it, like, you can just write it and put it, put your sign and give it. Mm -hmm. Or I'm a registrar of a university, I put seal and it's a, anyway, where, but it should have some authentication. So, but notary can't give. The one who has taken output should give. Mm -hmm. Maximum is that like, you want to add more value, go and get his seal, but your seal should be there, your sign should be there because you have taken the extract. So, therefore, if A is the owner of a company and B is the one who's taking the output, B should give, registrar should give, and not the vice chancellor because the registrar is in charge of all these computers, right? Or the head of the computer lab should give because he is in charge of the computer, he is taking the printout. Or, like, you know, for example, yeah, that's what. So, when A is taking printout, A should give, company can belong to B. So therefore, Reliance, Airtel and all, the one who takes the output should give. So you can you can go and catch hold of the manager and all. They may not change the job. But this person who's given the output would have changed the job if you've not taken the uh, seal before. That is the problem. Okay. So this certificate is very, very crucial. But you can ask why this complexity, why this unnecessary problem. See, otherwise, excuse me. Extremely sorry for that. So uh, this uh, notice is important because sometimes I can trap a person. Like you know, now at least these WhatsApp is coming up with lot of advanced features, right? So, uh, but earlier days, if you remember, if you're using WhatsApp, I send you a mob, uh, image or a video, it would get automatically downloaded on your mobile, right? and you have to go and delete everything. Otherwise, your you know your uh, uh, memory would be full. Then slowly that feature of disenabling you know, automatic downloading came. So now almost all of us would have disabled. It doesn't get automatically downloaded. Now, what if I send you a child porn material? It gets automatically downloaded. You wouldn't have even seen it. So, but then after some you know, days, I file a case saying you have possession of CP material in your mobile phone. It's so easy to trap, right? Or today it is very easy to hack computers. I hack your computer and in your name, I send an annoying message to your colleague. So I bring in this dispute between the two of you. What is the guarantee that, you know, this entire evidence belongs to so-and-so -so computer? So it is a further step of authentication, like how imaging, hashing helps you improving reliability, authenticity. 65 is also doing a similar job. At least it is making you take the responsibility that when you took the printout, the printout was this and you took the printout. So somebody is taking responsibility. Otherwise, tomorrow I can just give some printout without taking any responsibility and you might get punished. So that is the objective. Let's come to another interesting case. 
uh, this had happened in again Karnataka. So a person goes to an ATM bank, he withdraws 5,000 rupees, he gets the money. Then he realizes he didn't have 5,000 as balance. How did he get this money? So he realizes that there's some problem in the ATM machine. Okay. So he again and again withdraws 5,000, 5,000. So multiple you know, withdrawals he does. So then later bank files a case against him. To prove that he had withdrawn the money from the ATM machine, bank takes the slips from the ATM machine. So what is the slip? It's an output. It's a hard copy, right? So with the slip, they give a certificate saying that this slip belongs to this ATM. ATM is, machine is nothing but a computer today. See, earlier decisions, the decision which had said ATM machine is not a computer. But this is before 2008 amendment to the law. Now it is very clear that computer is a wider definition. It even includes your smart televisions your automated washing machines, you know, your IoT devices. So all of these are computers, if you look at the definition of computer. Coming back to this case. So in the high court, the argument of the defense was very clever. So they said, you say your, your ATM machine had a problem. Because of that problem, my client repeatedly withdraw the money. When you have a problem in your ATM machine, how can you give a certificate saying that at the time of taking the printout, my computer was in a working condition? So only with this argument, the defense won the case. Unfortunately, prosecution should have counter argued saying that, yes, my system had a problem of one feature. My system was otherwise functioning. The problem was with the withdrawal feature. The problem was not with the printing feature, right? They didn't make this argument. So this is an area where even now, you know, law enforcement agency is learning, prosecution is learning, the long way to go. So sometimes only because of the small tricks, defense wins. Yeah, I think there's a case a question in the chat box. Yes, madam, there is a question in the chat box from Shruti Prabhakar. Professor Shruti Prabhakar has raised this question. Does the WhatsApp messages or Facebook messages or regular messages require 65B certificate? Yes, it requires because how do you take it to the court, right? So. One way is I take, take it to the court, open my internet, open and show it to the court and all. But it, it's not safer, right? Uh, and neither the judge will have time for you to, you know, do all that, you know, live demo. So therefore, the ideal way is you take a printout of it, screenshots and a printout. So like that. So, so at the moment you take a screenshot, how do you give it to the court? Either in a soft copy format or in a hard copy format. So any computer, computer system, computer network, from anywhere you take an output, 65 is important. It becomes mandatory. You give the device itself, it's not important. But you can't give device when it comes to, uh, say, contents from Facebook and all, right? So better is take the entire layout printout or take a screenshot, save it, give it in a CV. So it's important that, you know, you, when you produce the evidence, this legal procedure is followed. Yeah. And today, it's not just for criminal cases. Even for civil matters, we're coming across cases where people are relying a lot on messengers and all. So in all those cases, 65B becomes important. Now, any other questions? What is said, any other questions, we can interact. Yeah. Uh, so now, there was another case where I had to give a consultation. CBI, with great difficulty, had got... Uh, some evidence from FBI of US in a CD, but unfortunately they're not in 65B. So gone, we can't use it because 166A says when you get evidence from another country, that is the procedure which I've already explained. But to use it as an evidence in India, you have to follow Indian law and Indian law requires you to give 65B. So I've seen a lot of cases getting affected only because of 65B. Now, this is an addition to technical difficulties that we have. And uh, so if you ensure that you have you produce 65, we ensure that you retain these evidences. It doesn't get destroyed. That is anyways focus of technical other technical sessions. Um, so this entire emulatory procedure is called as letter rogatory procedure. It's nothing but MLAT procedure. Uh, so then you have uh, the other issue. So let's assume you get, we've got all the evidence, but how do you get that person from another country? Then you need extradition agreement. If you don't have an extradition agreement, so both are different. MLA is only for collection of evidence, sharing of evidence. Extradition is to get a person extradited. So Malia, you know, you want him to be sent to India. We could initiate the process because we have signed extradition agreement with UK. Had it been any other country, even this attempt would not 
happen because you need extradition agreement otherwise they'll not send but they also as i said earlier many times they refuse to send because they will inquire and see whether it is an extraditable crime or not but they're not extraditable in nature very simple offense they're not sent death sentence punishable offense they're not sent so they have their own reasons to reject so we have to wait and see what will happen uh, what happens in these two cases so it has nothing to do with what our government uh, has done or going to do the legal procedure itself is so so complicated then it's come to another extremely important issue and that's about data privacy so what is data privacy because very soon this law is going to affect us you know, as individuals also is going to affect investigation so it's important to understand this data is a wider term right any information that is stored processed um handled uh, through computers transferred from one computer to another computer everything is data but uh, amongst that there's a part of data called as personal data morning briefly this issue has come so what is personal data say like for example uh, i am the one who prepare salary you know uh, receipts in your office so i have data about your uh, salary your scale your breakups hra etc et this is all data okay now that part of data with which you can be identified you in a sense the natural person human beings can be identified is called as personal data so that data with which you can be identified or that data in combination with other set of data if you are able to be identified it's called as personal data right now coming to another term it is called as sensitive personal data so sensitive personal data or sensitive person information means that part of personal data which is so sensitive that unless you properly take care of it it can be misused example the bank details bank account details password pin number health details etc because they're so sensitive that i can misuse i give you an example of how a blood group detail got leaked and that boy got killed because it can lead to many other medical frauds other illegal activity right so this is a sensitive information i'm sure many of you will have question about you know this covid data how it got leaked and all it is wrong but then maybe looking at that situation you know epidemic and all it was necessary so these are all our personal rights but when in public interest it is required is okay right we were trying to regulate covid spread so maybe it was necessary okay but legally what is the framework i'll explain in my class after this so these are the three terms currently it act uses i data personal data sensitive personal data okay for personal data and sensitive personal data it says any company can even include your universities this is the law can you implement it or not is a different issue any company any person any individual who's handling our personal data including our sensitive personal data should take care of that data if it gets leaked from them you know it is all in their computer but gets leaked maybe because of hacking cyber attack negligence of employees or they sell it whatever it gets leaked with them by them they are liable to pay compensation okay so this is what it act says under 43a so sensitive and, and uh, personal data both are covered under the same section all other data is come under 43 okay now if it is a police officer or any government officer who breaches your personal data 72 will apply this i already said in relation to the, uh, this um, uh, dk ravi case there is another section called 72a it is if intermediaries leak your personal data then they are liable under 72a intermediaries includes facebook also right today a lot of allegations about data analytics and all that been done So if it is proved, they can be liable under seventy two. So theoretically, they can be liable, but now you know procedurally there are so many difficulties. How do you prove it beyond reasonable doubt and all? This is the current law, but very soon you will have PDP bill. So PDP bill is going to talk about other issues. It's going to talk about data localization. I already said about this, which means they want you to keep one data, at least one copy in India. You have your server in America, okay. but your company should also have a copy in india so that when we need for our investigation we get it lot of our cases are failing because it's not available terrorism cases we can't investigate because it's not available so these are the you know, questions uh, for which they are seeking for answers through this you know solution so that is they you know so this is you can send any companies in india and transfer your data to another country 
Like let's assume there's an MNC which is collecting our data. They can send it to their partner company, outsource company in US, provided in US also they have an equally protecting law. If not better, at least equal legal protection should be given in that country. So data transfer to any country which doesn't protect our data will not be allowed. Okay? So now there's another concept called as data sovereignty. What is data sovereignty? So for this purpose, we should know that they're going to use another term called as critical personal information or critical personal data. See, as of now, we're only using these three terms, data, personal data, sensitive personal data. Now onwards, once the new law comes, they'll have another set of data called as critical personal information. Which are these are so critical that government feels it should never go outside the country. Okay, so they're going to list which are these critical personal information, and no one can send these data outside the country. It may or may not include biometric data. I, we have yet to wait. So this is going to be the going to be the new law. And when it comes to critical personal data, they want to have sovereignty. They don't want to give it to any other country. The people think, you know, our government can misuse and all. That's a different issue. But what if some other government misuses it? What if some other country's company misuses it? So to prevent that, this PDP bill is coming. So as of now, IT Act to an extent takes care of data protection. And uh, when it comes to all this, see, this data can also take form of evidence. So when it is evidence, we should ensure that you should only use it when it is required. So I'll then come to my last issue. In the case, I'm sure you would have heard about this called this. The Supreme Court of India recently has said that we all have right to life, right? Right to life is given to us under Article 21. Right to life includes right to live with dignity and liberty. Sorry for that, uh, you know, spelling mistakes. Okay, <laughs> really sorry. Now the Supreme Court says right to life also includes right to privacy. And right to privacy includes information privacy how are other rights different from fundamental rights the fundamental rights what was by the constitution how are these different from other rights see other rights i breach your right you can file a case on me it's between you and me but fundamental rights even state cannot breach it even government cannot take away our right to leave right to privacy right to dignity and all Unless there is, Article 21 says, all of us have right to life, you know, and it cannot be curtailed unless there is a procedure established by law. Okay, so which means Arnav Goswami has right to live, he has right to liberty, and he can also be arrested provided you follow arrest law. Have they followed or not is different. Tomorrow if court says they have not followed, it will be treated as unconstitutional. So if they show, no, we have followed all CRPC, what is that procedure? CRPC procedure, IT Act procedure, et cetera. Okay, let's come to like to what extent police can collect our data from mobile phone, laptop, surveillance and all. So in Puttaswami case, court says, when you're encroaching on privacy, there should be a law which would allow you to encroach. There should be a law. That law should have a legitimate object. You know, if it is only to say, collect data of my citizens without any Good purpose, it's wrong. That law should have a legitimate purpose. Now think of Aadhaar Act. Aadhaar Act, they say they have a legitimate purpose to have this because they want to give you financial benefits and all. Right? Otherwise, it was all the allegation was it was all getting misused and all. So it should have a legitimate purpose. Now, in the name of legitimate purpose, can I take any or every date of yours? No. Only take that which is necessary, apportionate to the object of the law. So which means I have right to live, right, right to privacy. You state can interfere with it, provided law allows, and that law has a legitimate object, and the extent of breach of my, my privacy is proportionate. I'll end this with you. So in this case, Otto Shankar was involved in a lot of criminal cases and all. He was serving his sentence in the prison. He wanted to write an autobiography of his own, and he wanted to publish it. But while in the book, he had also written about corruption in the prison and all. So when he wanted to publish, prison authorities got to know. They went to the court and they said, no, this is breach of privacy and all. Court said, no, this has nothing to do with your privacy. It's all about official scenario and all, right? So privacy is about personal life of a person, person, personal you know, information of a person. There's another case where a person was already punished 
he comes back out of the prison but he was like a habitual offender in the sense he was repeatedly committing offense so a police had kept an eye, or eye on him so much so that they would go to his house even in the night just to check whether he is in house or not then he goes to the supreme court and he says these people are just you know breaching my privacy their physical surveillance breaching my right to privacy that time only court had said yes right to privacy is a precious right you can't simply go and tap his door at any or every time because breach of privacy should be proportionate so the supreme court in putas swami case has reiterated the same thing so this is on the whole about the law which deals with cyber crime certain offenses are civil including data related cyber crimes etc some are criminal some are both if it is criminal and if it is cognizable investigation is a must if it is non cognizable investigation will not be done directly matters go to the court because these are not serious in nature they are simple in nature in the course of investigation if arrest is necessary it can happen provided the offence is punishable with more than 7 years otherwise it should not happen and even then as far as possible give the bail the rule j should be an exception because every custody would indicate that you are encroaching on a person's right to life and liberty so unless that jail is essential don't subject a person to jail this is all in our law but practically what happens is what we are all seeing around us we can now take questions yeah so difficulty in tracing evidence one is as i mentioned some So there is a question why there are so many difficulties in tracing cyber evidence. So one is nature of evidence. It's not like a knife that you can see. It's not like a revolver or a bullet that you can see, unlike in a conventional crime. So it's all about metadata and all. It gets more complicated, right? And then secondly, these are the evidences which can be very easily deleted. Also, thirdly, let's assume I confiscate the data. I don't properly store it. This data gets spoiled. Like you know, you would have noticed. You don't use CDs for years together. It gets it becomes junk so police let's assume they've investigated a device today and file a charge sheet next year in that one year if the cd is not properly taken care gone the evidence in it is gone the hard disk gets corrupted it's gone so they have to maintain it properly and not every police officer is trained in this they're getting trained it's a better scenario compared to last few years but it is still a, you know huge issue so all like let's assume i am a constable i'm taking hard disk from police station to the lab on the way i drop it accidentally gone right so these are all very fragile so like this there are many challenges and then other example i come to a crime scene i'm searching for evidences in the crime scene it's a house of the accused and there is a pen and i think this is a pen and i leave but then actually it's a pen drive which is looking like a pen i've left the evidence there so the challenge lies in identifying the evidence then in confiscation i do not confiscate this in the presence of two witnesses who will come and support my case in the court or you are the witness you are refusing to come to the police station if you are in my jurisdiction i know how to take you but if you are sitting in like say some other state how will i bring you so lack of cooperation from witnesses but if you see from witnesses perspective they have their own problem why should i leave my job and go and sit in police station for holding why should i leave my job and go repeatedly you know to visit the court so there are many it's a very complex question many times even victim doesn't realize that he or she has become a victim of cyber crime for example i hack your system i'm silently observing your computer usage you don't even know i've hacked so there is no case at all right so lot of reasons and the mostly for india it's a reality that we don't get cooperation from other countries we don't get evidence from facebook yahoo twitter all these are the platforms on which crimes are taking place so today morning also one of my student called in the afternoon saying he wants to register an fir they struggling to register fir i said i'll get back to you in the evening meantime try these alternatives very hard to get fir registered for us and for police very hard to get evidence it's a lot of complexity at every stage i mentioned any other questions the can't hear madam one question from uh, ekan pawar ma'am yeah. tell us about credit card fraud and the legal procedure why there is there are so many difficulties in the tracing the cyber evidence right so now what's happening is for some forms of wrongs some alternative remedies are coming up for example any bank related fraud okay so rbi guideline says that 
uh, if you have also contributed to the wrong, you were negligent, you gave your CV number, why should bank be responsible, right? So now it's very clear. So if you have uh, uh, contributed, the wrong so i share my cv number i share my password then bank is not liable first thing secondly however as soon as i give that number i suddenly realize i've done a mistake immediately call the bank get it blocked you don't do this also you continue to be negligent you don't inform the bank also so no one is responsible your case is gone and you expect police to investigate it's so hard to investigate especially if these accounts are from abroad and all so that's one thing secondly there's no negligence at all from my side, but still there is an unauthorized transfer of money. RBI guideline clearly says that if you inform this to the bank and the police within so-and-so time, you have complete chance of getting back your money. So they say some hours is fixed in that circular. Let's assume it's 48 hours. Within 48 hours, I inform the bank and the uh, police station, I get the entire money. Little delay, some money is count, uh, no, cut. Little more delay, more money is cut. So the sooner you act, the more is the you know, possibility of getting back the money that you've lost, provided you're not negligent. So now in Umar Shankar case, a lot of cases, courts have very clearly said that if you are negligent, then they can't be liable. So for these at least banking frauds, you have RBI guidelines clarifying. But for uh, many other kinds, you know, CP, child pornography and all, there's only one option, that is just going to the police. I have no other options. Any other questions? Madam, uh, since from uh, uh, two days, uh, one of your student uh, is uh, in this session. Amulia. Okay. Oh, I am Amulia. Yeah, student. <laughs> this might be like a revision to you. <laughs> Whenever I, I feel so, but you will not let me feel like that because every time you start off, you come up with a new information and every time it's like, you know, oh, add on to it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that I get yeah, to you. You know, so many incidences happening around you. I didn't want you to make it completely criminal. Otherwise, so much to talk about Sushant Singh case, drugs cases, Riyaz case, <laughs> yeah, Arnab's case. Thank the entire you. day, the session went on very well, ma'am. It was very excellent. Thank you. Uh, very honored to be uh, in this particular event. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, so my pleasure. Lecture, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, madam, actually, one more. Uh, uh, I have three questions, madam. Uh, actually, Kasab and uh, his group mates, they have crossed the geographical boundary mm -hmm. and they raided the uh, arbor of terrorism against our public. Therefore, it is a terrorism. So, it is a terrorist activity. Right. But actually, the terrorism, uh, whoever may uh, act uh, likely to affect the sovereignty of the country, the sovereignty of the country, it may be an attack on our health system, or it may be an attack on our financial system, or it may be an attack on our parliamentary, of any kind of sovereignty it needs. But uh, the uh, same Indian nationals who engage in corruption of a large quantity, 500 crores, 1,500 crores, and they affect the financial system of our country, will it not attract the terrorism? Right. See, that's a very, very good, uh, you know, uh, uh, thought. In fact, like uh, this is what is the argument of some now, at least. You know, they say it affect doing something that affects economy. They are now started. They started calling it as economic security of the nation. So that's how they want to bring it under national security. So this process has begun. But anyways, now we have laws under which financial frauds can be handled. So we have made some amendments to companies that under that we have separate set of rules which takes care of financial frauds like IMA scams and all. So then punishments are very severe. You may not call it as terrorism, but punishment is equal like that of terrorism. But any financial fraud which directly gets you know related to terrorist activity. So I make money and invest for terrorism, or it's a drug trafficking and all the profit goes to terrorism, then terrorism law will also directly come. But yes, it's a very good point, as I said, because now PDP bill, one argument, now Joint Parliament Committee is taking inputs from fam, from people. So one input that has gone from some think tank is uh, to treat economic security also as a part of national security. Let's see whether they'll, they'll be able to understand this, accept this, appreciate this or not. Madam, one more kind of a terrorism in uh, uh, health uh, industry and uh, some uh, nursing homes or the private hospitals, they charge the FT, FT, they make FT charges 
so that the indian citizens cannot afford it and they cannot avail the health services uh, is it not equivalent to terrorism by denying their fundamental right to health see i understand when we uh, are using this word terrorism you want to indicate it's extremely serious mm. in nature right but then every serious wrong is can't be called as uh, you know terrorism i'll give a simple example uh, it's not a crpc or criminal class so i didn't take this but otherwise what is murder for you and me for layman every act of killing is no legally murder is not just Right. Murder is when I kill with very clear intention of causing his death. I have no other object but to cause his death, so I shoot at him here. That is murder. What if I stab at him, say on the arm, repeatedly he dies? It's not murder because their intention is not clear. It comes more clearer the intention the man says, more serious the offence. So it will come down to culpable homicide, not amounting to murder. the third example i am riding my vehicle very fast there is a road accident case and he dies it's ra ra uh, rash uh, negligence or it's called reckless you know reckless leading punishment it is little lesser the fourth one i am a doctor while operating he dies patient dies so it's a negligent homicide so murder culpable homicide recklessness and uh, negligence so punishment gets reduced so like that otherwise for common man every act of killing is murder but no then there is a case where a person goes to ask his money that it given uh, for uh, loan it was just one nana one paisa case the other person refuses so he hits him on his head and he dies course is this is also not murder for one paisa would want to kill so his intention is not to kill so they reduce it to hurt like that okay so for a common man we assign same word to everything what is terrorism is clearly defined that which creates terror not just in your or my mind in the large number of minds of people firstly that which affects sovereignty that you know that that uh, power of the state security of the state integrity of the state it's good that the definition is narrow but if you widen this power is possible right 66 that was the problem anything or everything said on internet you know was a crime yes for example uh, nero modi cheated a lot of uh, people and he ran away from the country but uh, i have though i have not lost anything because i am a countryman when i come to know that uh, news i was terrified then he did not tell it even one for one thing of india he be paid for the terrorism so lord define that that's what i'm trying to say lord define terrorism to include that. so come within the definition of like now for example uh, what is hacking we all know unauthorized unauthorized right? unauthorized access something is not amounting to access hacking can't be made out like that so it should come within the definition given in the law i'll give you the last best example what is dowry death it should be a death unnatural death of a married mm -hmm. woman within 7 years from the date of marriage soon before that there should be cruelty this cruelty should be related to dowry death even dowry demand even one element is missing we don't call it as dowry death For example, that women dies one day after seven years. It's not dowry death. You have to prove it as murder or some other offence. It's not dowry death. So like that, it should come within the legally, you know, defined term. So legally, as of now, we don't define terrorism like this. You and I may feel it, but then law doesn't look at it. Another example: I take your photograph on a uh, uh, when you are in a mall. It's in a public place. You may feel offended, but it's not an offence because law doesn't recognise this as an offence, right? So unless tomorrow law comes that you know saying that you can't take photograph of people without their consent, till then it is not an offence. So we want to include this, but too much wider is problematic. As take a criminal law, you're empowering state, and how will a common man defend himself when Adnan can't defend himself? Imagine if we are in his face. It's 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 a very dangerous thing. So law should be narrow. very clear as i said proportionate to the object the object is to curb different offenses differently yes sir madam uh, chief, chief minister of a state chief minister of a state made a misappropriation amount to the extent of 50000 crore is it not affecting the economy of the country is it not affecting the sovereignty so that's what so there are offenses under which he can be tried not for terrorism but there are as i said yeah. other laws so, and you have economic offences related laws yes, financial yes. laws then we try it under different law like how today we could only look at ipc very briefly and it act like that there are many other laws so under those other
proved guilty beyond reasonable doubt, or, you know, before the court, they're not convicts. They're only accused. So, yeah. Okay, okay. Right. Participant, dear participants, uh, you have any other uh, questions and queries uh, so you can please interact with our uh, resource person, Dr. Nagarat Mahi. I request participants to feel free and interact. So either it was very, very <laughs> but it was a good uh, uh, session for me as well. Patients that came between uh, were thought, thought yeah, I, was, I did it. Uh, professors of uh, different engineering colleges. Uh, okay. right. That's really nice. Uh, and, and like I think today's session is more valuable than all other sessions. Not saying because I am teaching, but yeah, in yesterday's context, it's legal services, uh, you know, uh, day celebrated in the national level. But throughout this month, a lot of law, you know, awareness programs are done. So today's session's object is not just to fill in the inputs about cyber security, it's rather to make us aware about legal rights that we have. So if that object is fulfilled. It's Anyway, actually, I got your contact number uh, four years ago from the website of a National Law College. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'll just leave my uh, email here. Some are asking for it. Yeah, uh, Somebody is asking me my right. Yeah. Uh, dear participants, you have any other queries? Madam, for you to cover Indian crime laws, uh, three sessions are not sufficient, you know. True, sir. I had to rush through. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think it's a good thing. For us to introduce you to our audience, uh, one session is not sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> Your achievements okay. are so high. <laughs> Dear participants, hope you have enjoyed these three sessions uh, today with our Dr. Nagratna A. Madam. Madam is a very key consultant to the Union of India to frame the policies. Uh, therefore, uh, she is with us and uh, we are very happy because I cannot express my happiness, madam, <laughs> three days. Uh, last time when I was conducting a faculty development program, uh, uh, we are unable to get you because of your busy schedule. And that is, I think, uh, during uh, 2016, madam, uh, it has happened. But uh, today, uh, I am very lucky to have your session and I want to uh, conduct uh, this kind of a workshop uh, fully on cyber law for six days. I think uh, along with your uh, colleague Sairav but is also there, <laughs> there in your college. Uh, okay, uh, madam, uh, thank you very much, madam. We are very, very happy. All our participants are also in the chat box, they're sending uh, uh, the feedback that the session is very, very informative. Madam, we are very lucky to have with us and uh, you have accepted our invitation and you are with us. On behalf of the Siddhanga Education Society, and on behalf of Siddhanga Institute of Technology, and on behalf of faculty and the students, and on behalf of our participants, I express deep sense of gratitude and thanks to you, madam. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Dear participants, uh, today's session, third session.